Welcome to the Choose You Netcast. This is Jim Langlois with the word from Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's my prayer that this netcast will encourage and cheer you on as we join forces to draw the line in the sand, defending our faith and our households in the resurrection power of Jesus. Join me each weekday as we dig deeply into God's amazing word and bring up the rich treasures of his blessings. Are you ready? Choose you this day whom you will serve. But that's me and my house, me and my house, me and my house. I said, choose you this day whom you will serve. But that's for me and my house, me and my house, me and my house. Good morning, NetWorld, and thank you for tuning in. We're continuing in our series titled The Family Bible Revolution an end-time message for his generational blessing. We left off yesterday talking about the third essential for the family Bible revolution being anointed and appointed, because those who have been given the responsibility and the authority for managing family worship have also been anointed and appointed for the job. Today, we will begin the fourth essential being generational. Let's review all five essentials for the family Bible revolution. First, family worship is the focus of God's Word being presented and discussed in the household on a regular basis. Second, authority establishes the responsibility, respect, and honor. Third, appointed and anointed speaks of calling, gifting, and the God-given ability to fulfill that call. Fourth, generational speaks of the strength and energy of the young and the wisdom and fortitude of the old together. And finally, Church worship speaks of the importance of the Sabbath and our gathering unto him in the beauty of holiness. So, essential number four is generational, and it speaks of the strength and energy of the young and the wisdom and fortitude of the old together. It includes the family, children, siblings, young adults, singles, grandparents, and it talks about mentoring and modeling. What I'm about to quote, I believe to be the prophesied model of the last day's New Testament church. Are we ready for it? Are you ready for it? Is the church ready for it? We find it in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If I'm right, and I believe I am, we need to take a hard look at this passage and see if we fit the prophecy. If not, then we need to figure out how to allow the Spirit of God to move in this fashion in our homes and in our church assemblies. The first thing I notice is it includes sons and daughters, young men and old men, men servants and maidservants. It says this move of the Spirit will include all flesh and that all will prophesy. The wonders in heaven and the signs in the earth will include all those mentioned, and due to this manifestation, many will call on the name of the Lord to be saved. This will cause a great revival. Let's go a little further. And I like the words Peter speaks here when he says, What shall we do? Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Notice that the promise of the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit 
is to you and your children and to as many as the Lord our God will call. What does this mean? Taken into context with John 3.16, which says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And also taken into context with 2 Peter 3.9, which says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. These scriptures tell us it means all flesh, sons and daughters, young men and old men, men servants and maid servants. Let's read Matthew eighteen fourteen. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Well, if not one of the little ones, including boys and girls, then not one of the younger ones or the older ones either. Do our church services look like this? Why would we separate the children and the younger out if they're supposed to be a part of the move of the Spirit with us together? Do we feel they're too young to understand? Do we feel they can only handle pablum and not the meat of the word? Do we believe they need to wait to be filled with the Spirit? Do we feel the wonders in heaven above and the signs in earth beneath will be too strong for them? Does Mark sixteen seventeen through 18 only relate to the spiritually mature, the theologically trained, the Bible school graduates, and the ones who can sit still in a chair for an hour? Listen to this. Mark sixteen seventeen through 18, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You see, the only requirement to move in the Spirit is believe. It's not gender-based or age-based. Just think, many churches today have no open manifestation of the Spirit of God through prophecy tongues in interpretation, casting out devils, and the laying on of hands for the sick. Also, many churches have removed the children and the young from the adult services. The family is divided. The responsibility in raising the children in the word has been delegated to the church. The parents have been left out of the loop and not trained in how to be a family. Family worship has been replaced by church worship. Family time has been replaced by church time. All the powers of heaven have been reduced to 60 to 90 minutes, two songs, the offering, the announcements, a special song, a 15-minute message with no laying on of hands, no prophecy, no tongues and interpretation, no power, and no miracles and wonders. The children have been sent to a class to hear a story, play a game, sing a song, watch a video, have a snack, color a page, and wait for mom or dad to return. The youth have done much of the same, just louder, darker, with moving lights, with a 20-something-year-old leader, and words like stay away from drugs and sex. What if we all met together and had a service like Joel prophesied? What if mom and dad were trained how to have family worship at home? What if they had family worship twice a day together, read the word together, discussed the word together, sang a song together, prayed for each other together? laid hands on each other together, prayed in tongues together, took authority over the devil together, believed God for their needs together, six days a week together. What if? Well, if they did that at home, I can only imagine what would happen at church together. Maybe, above all, we could ask or think, as it says in Ephesians 3.20. Let's go a little further. Acts 2, 42 through 43, it says, And they... Hmm, we'll discuss who they are in a minute. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Who are they? All of them, sons and daughters, young men and old men, men servants and maid servants. What happened? Wonders and signs. It's all adding up. What did they do? They did four things, but actually two, as I'll explain. In Acts 2.42, we read, 1, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, 2, fellowship, 3, breaking of bread, 4, prayer. However, if we look a little deeper, I believe it's only two things with two additional definitions of one. I believe it's the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And then fellowship is further broken down by saying, in the breaking of bread and prayer. So it's the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, which is 
the breaking of bread, and prayer. Who's included? Sons and daughters, young men and old men, men servants and maidservants, all flesh. Let's finish the chapter. Acts 2, 40 through 47. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Notice with one accord in the temple and house to house. They met together in the temple and they met together in the house. I believe Acts 2.42 is tantamount to the success of the church and its evangelism to the world. The Message Bible puts it this way. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. And then the Living Bible says it this way. They joined with the other believers in regular attendance at the apostles' teaching sessions and at the communion services and prayer meetings. Because the saints at church and at home followed the pattern of life together, their strength, their witness, and the move of the Spirit through signs and wonders brought great growth, discipleship, and mentoring. It passed the baton to the next generation. Verse 41 says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then in verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Dictionary.com defines generational as pertaining to what we're talking about to mean the entire body of individuals born and living about the same time. Generational family worship and generational corporate worship is every age, male and female, young and old, children, sons and daughters, young men and old men, Men servants and maid servants together, dreaming dreams and seeing visions, filled with the Spirit and prophesying at church and in the home. Can you see it? That's really powerful. However, our society today is extremely age segregated. Through secular philosophies and big government, over many years we have slowly developed into a completely divided family where every age has its own culture. Children no longer relate to their parents or their older siblings. Grandparents are practically put out to pasture as useless. And teenagers have little to no relationship with their parents, their younger siblings, or their grandparents. How has this happened? Wow, our time is up. I wish we could continue, but we'll have to do it tomorrow. So I look forward to being with you in my next netcast. Mark your calendar again, set your clock, and tune in as we continue in establishing the Family Bible Revolution, an end-time message for His generational blessing. I call you blessed. You have been listening to the Choose You Netcast with Jim Langlois. If you have enjoyed this program, you can find out more about Jim Langlois Ministries on the Master's House website at tmhnow.org. That's tmhnow.org. On the media tab, you can listen to many more messages, subscribe to my daily devotional emails, and follow the link to my blog site. If you'd like to write me or become a financial partner with this ministry, my address is The Master's House, Post Office Box 1568, Mechanicsville, Virginia, 23116. That's The Master's House, Post Office Box 1568, Mechanicsville, Virginia, 23116. Online donations can also be made at tmhnow.org, and my email address is pastorjim at tmhnow.org. This is Jim Langlois saying be blessed, you and your whole household. Until next time. Choose you this day, but well, that's for me and my house, me and my house, me and my house.